Um, I'm going to start with the Equal Pay Act. 1963 basically argues men and women in the same job should be paid the same salary. So the Equal Pay Act, the intention of the Equal Pay Act is to ensure that women are getting paid the same as men doing the exact same job. And, and really, even for years after that, women were still told, well, you don't need to make as much as a man because a man is supporting a family and you're not. Um, and so women were given differential pay even into the 70s and the 80s. Maybe less so now, although I still think it's kind of relevant, but certainly less so now. Um, you know, but it's still a concern. People are still um, making different pay because of um, you know all sorts of problems around that. So, why did the law exist? Why does it only cover men and women and doesn't cover issues of race or, or ethnicity or religion or things like that? Well, because the expectation was, a year later, if you will, that in 1964 they were going to really try to tackle the, um, the civil rights legislation and deal with the issues of race race, religion, ethnic origin, and color. Sex was not going to be a part of that. It really wasn't expected to be a part of it until significantly later into the 1960s and perhaps even into the 1970s. Um, it was going to be pushed back. So why did sex end up being a big part of that legislation? Well, it, because there was a, a um, we call him the accidental feminist. There was a congressman who was really not interested in seeing this legislation pass. Um, and so his intention was to add sex discrimination to the pile to either slow it down or grind the legislation to a halt. Because, you know, the expectation was, while people would might entertain the idea of um, different races or ethnicities, um, you know, men, you know, having the right to work, there was still this stigma against women having that right to, uh, to, to have equal jobs to men. Um, women were expected to be home and, 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 and not intended to be in the workplace, at least certainly at that time. Um, so the guy added said, hey, we need to add sex discrimination to this, figuring it was going to actually slow it down or grind it to a halt. And in fact, it sort of had the opposite effect in that, um, you know, people liked the idea and said, you're right, these are all groups that are historically discriminated against and they should be all included in this civil rights legislation. So let's add them. And so sex discrimination got added. But as you can, as I've already sort of implied from an earlier discussion in this lecture, adding sex discrimination to the pile um, became a challenge because it wasn't as fully developed as it could have been. And even if it was fully developed, I think there are still difficulties in, 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 in anticipating all aspects of what might be considered sex discrimination. And, and it's one of the reasons why it took almost 20 years for sexual harassment, as I said, to be considered a form of sex discrimination or pregnancy be considered a form of sex discrimination or asking people about their spouses and their children. And that was a form of sex discrimination or judging women on how much makeup they wear or whether or not they act feminine. And that's a form of sex discrimination. And, and it's the same thing for men, too. If men are expected to act in a certain way or dress in a certain way, that's a form of sex discrimination for men because there's this an assumption that there's a gender role that men need to play. And if they don't follow that gender role, therefore, um, you know, that would be a bad thing. And so when people get harassed for not following those gender roles um, or gendered behaviors, um, then you know, they get harassed for that, that's a form of sex discrimination as well. So, <clears throat> your protected class is sex, race, religion, ethnic origin, and color. If you um, feel that an employment decision was made based on your sex, based on your religion, based on your color, your sex, your ethnic origin, you are protected under the Civil Rights Act, right? There are special protected classes where we give extra scrutiny Two cases where women, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans are um, discriminated against. That doesn't mean that we don't care about the straight white male. You know, what we care about is ensuring everybody gets protected. But we recognize that historically, these groups in particular have had a long history of discrimination. So these cases get scrutiny and they get more attention. We're more apt to see these cases anyway, but absolutely under no circumstance does it mean that um, 
um, white males are not included in that in that pile for legislation. In fact, that they are, um, and there are many many cases throughout history where white men have um, sued under the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and have won their cases because they've been treated differently because of their sex, because of their color. The last item underneath there is what we call a mixed motive case. And what a mixed motive case is, is where we may say um, something to the effect of, and this is, this is a famous case, this is Hopkins v. Pricewaterhouse, where we say to, this, they, Pricewaterhouse said to Ann Hopkins, um, you're very abrupt, you're not really good with clients, um, the, you know, you're, you know, even though you do really good work and you're productive, you know, sometimes you have a brusque attitude with our clients. The support staff doesn't like you because you're kind of rude to them sometimes. And, and so, and that in and of itself might have been a good reason not to make her a partner or not promote her, you know, in the accounting firm where she was working. But then they blew it. They turned around and they said, and you need to act more feminine, look more feminine, talk more feminine, be more feminine. Um, and they blew it. And a mixed motive means you've got a reason that's legitimate, right? You, you're brusque with clients, you're brusque with support staff, and that's not appropriate. And then you have what we call an illegitimate reason or an inappropriate reason, you're not acting feminine enough. And so what happens is the, um, the, the illegal discrimination claim that you aren't acting feminine enough or whatever might be the illegal claim taints the legitimate claim. And we're not, it becomes very difficult to tease apart how much of the case is really based on the legitimate reasons and how much of it might be influenced by the inappropriate or the illegitimate reasons. And hence, a mixed motive case um, tends to rule in the favor of the plaintiff because, you know, if it's tainted by this inappropriate association that they need to be more feminine or they shouldn't act so black or Latino and, you know, stupid, you know, you know, uh, stereotypes that people engage in, the bottom line is the mixed motive means if it's partly bad, it's all bad. Um, and while Ann Hopkins didn't originally win her case, it, it changed the way case law worked and interpreted the cases, and now mixed motives are an important part of interpretations of civil rights law. So just be aware, um, you know, that when we give reasons for why we're not hiring someone, that we have to be careful of things that are based on uh, sex, dis including descriptions of things that are based on sex, sex discrimination, race, religion, ethnic origin, or color. Even if we have some really good solid reasons to say we need to get rid of this person, you don't want to add in, and they're not feminine enough, or and they're acting too black, or you know, whatever that is supposed to actually mean, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, you hear people say that sort of stuff all the time. So just be really careful, um, you know, in the language that you use. Um, if someone legitimately should not be hired, regardless of their sex, race, religion, ethnic origin, color, don't add in other stuff that's irrelevant and inappropriate. You've got a good case that they're not doing a good job, then use that language to say you're, they're not doing a good job. Um, you know, it's inappropriate for us to be adding other factors that are completely irrelevant because it taints it. You know, it, it creates a more of a problem for the company than anything else. So when we're trying to determine what is uh, considered illegal discrimination under the Civil Rights Act, there are two different types. One is what we call disparate treatment, and the other is what I call adverse impact. You may also hear it called disparate impact but I like to keep the terminology as different as possible. So disparate treatment and adverse impact um, are, is the way that I tend to describe both those categories of illegal discrimination. So we'll start with disparate treatment. Um, disparate treatment means that I am treating someone differently because they are in one of those protected classes. I'm treating you differently because you are Latino. I'm treating you differently because you're white. I'm treating you differently because you're a woman. I'm you, treating you differently because you're Muslim. You're in a protected class and the, 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 the discriminatory behavior is because you are a member of that class, whatever that is. So how does this, how do you make your case? How do you prove that there's a legal discrimination? Well, obviously the proof has to come through the evidence within the court of law, but in order for a case to go forward, the plaintiff has to make what they call a prima facie case, which means the plaintiff needs to demonstrate a number of different things. Number one, that the, um, that they are 
belong to that protected class that, you know, they feel that they were treated differently because of their race, their sex, their religion, whatever. They have to make that case, first of all, and say, I was treated differently from my religion, and here's the reasons why, to prove it. Then they have to say that they applied for a job for which they were completely qualified. How do you know whether or not someone is qualified for the job? Well, you know from the job description and the recruitment advertisement, which is why it's really important when we're advertising for recruiting that we're really truthful in what we want to see as the minimum criteria for people to come and apply for the job. So someone applies for the job for which they're qualified, and the organization doesn't hire them. Now, that in and of itself is not the problem, because organizations make important decisions all the time about who they're going to hire and who they're not going to hire. But where the, where the catch comes in is either they hired somebody with lesser experience than them. Let's say you, you have to have a minimum of five years experience and you notice, you find out that they hired somebody with two years experience. Whoa, why is that? Um, or, you know, you, you apply for the job, you were rejected, and they're still accepting resumes. Well, if I've met all the minimum criteria, why would you continue to search for jobs and say that the job is still open when you've gotten my resume and you've told me you're not interested in looking at me as an applicant. This is not to say that there aren't legitimate reasons for the organization to do that. It's possible that they may have found out that someone has a, a felony on their record or they had um, someone has inside knowledge about the candidate, just as we were talking about the other night, where someone says, oh, I know that person, and um, I know that they committed a crime, and I, I don't want them to work here. And, and there may be all sorts of legitimate reasons why someone might be rejected outright, although the employer sort of owes you an explanation, you know, because of this on your record, we're, we're, we, you're not eligible for employment. But to say, thank you so much for your application, we're not interested at this time, you know, that is it's not transparent. You're not really letting the person know the real reason why they're being rejected. And so it, it opens you up for, am I being rejected because I'm a woman or because of my race or because, you know, I happen to wear a headscarf and I'm a Muslim? You know, why is that? And so, the, it, and it really has to do with the, um, the, the time you know, similarity of when some of these events occur. Um, obviously, this is not a simple checklist. Oh, I applied. Oh, I didn't get it. Oh, I'm a woman, so therefore it's discrimination. That's not the case. You really have to demonstrate that you had all the criteria and that they still kept looking for people or that they hired people who were less qualified than you. And that's, that is the situation that where you could turn around and go, you know what? That was illegal discrimination. You truly treated me differently because of whatever protected class I'm in. So you have to be say that it's because I'm a woman, because of my race, because of my religion, and here's the reasons why, and here's how I can show that it was part of my religion. I wear a headscarf, so of course they knew I was a Muslim. So you walk in, you apply for the job, they don't hire you for whatever reason, and, and very likely don't give you a reason why they didn't hire you, and they may still be searching for somebody, and there's no reason why if you've met all the minimum criteria. The only legitimate reason would be, well, you saw me with a headscarf, so clearly you knew I was a Muslim, and you don't want to hire Muslims, you know. And to say that, you know, that that sort of thing doesn't occur, I know it occurs all the time. I, I had a boss that I worked for who told me there were certain racial groups he would not hire, ever, and I had to... Uh, handle that in a way that was really delicate. I always made sure all job candidates got sent to him um, and he would make the final decision about who he would hire, but you know, I could not, I didn't want to to demonstrate that I was pre-screening people because of that. I was sending you know, sending people up there um, you know, very quickly and very legitimately, you know, all possible candidates to the president to make that decision. Um, unfortunately, they made some, some bad choices. I don't know if they ever got caught, you know, and, and they had some problems around that, but nonetheless, it's that's something to always be aware of. I mean, it's it's a very difficult line to walk, you know, when you're, um, when you know that the people who are making the hiring decisions are discriminating and you can say something to a point and, and you either have to make a decision to leave or to, to be complicit in, in that activity and that's not appropriate. <clears throat> so once the, the plaintiff makes their prima facie case that they that it, that it seems to be pretty clear based on the proximity of events that I was not hired because I'm a woman, because of my color, because of my race, sex, ethnicity, whatever, um, religion, I mean it's, it seems pretty clear that that was the relationship, therefore 
um, the burden of proof then shifts over to the employer. I mean, the, the, the EEOC or the lawyer comes in and says, hey, here's some facts. They met their prima facie case. Tell me what your reasons were for not hiring this person. Show me that there was a legitimate reason for not hiring them. And if you can't show me a legitimate reason for not hiring them, we're going to take this to court. And that's basically how the process works. Um, so once they go to court, then of course the court makes a decision based on the facts, you know, um, what's going to happen. But the burden of proof now falls on the employer to say, I didn't discriminate and here's the evidence why I did not discriminate. So adverse impact differs from disparate treatment. Um, and again, why I call it um, adverse impact versus a disparate impact. Again, it helps to really differentiate the two terms and make it easier to recall what each one does. Disparate treatment is purposeful treatment. I purposefully treat you different because you are a woman, because you are African American, because you are a Muslim. Um, I'm going to treat you different because you're a member of that category, whatever it is. And it's a very purposeful and intentional um, act. I am holding you to different standards. I'm holding you to perhaps higher standards, more difficult, more stringent standards that you have to leap over in order to get into a particular job. And that's inappropriate. That's illegal discrimination using um, um, disparate treatment. Adverse impact is um, unintentional. It may, we're holding everybody to the same standard. You know, I'm holding you and I to the same hiring standard. You have to score an 80 or above in order to be hired. But what we're finding is um, that there are less women and minorities that are passing those tests. They are less likely to score well and they're less likely to get those jobs because the criteria that you're using, equally for everybody, may be having an unintended impact against the group. Now there are times when we set a standard, we say this is the standard that people have to have to get in that job, it's validated, it's legitimate, it absolutely makes sense, it's a great predictor, and we're still going to have less women and minorities because they can't seem to pass that threshold of success. And we see this, um, you know, with firefighters. We see less women and minorities in firefighting because the physical requirements for that particular job are pretty high and they're legitimately high. Um, and, and if you can't physically do that job, there's no reason for you to be in there. And that's not considered adverse impact. It's adverse impact if we're using a criteria that seems stringent and it's unnecessarily stringent. And the, the key case to this one was Griggs versus Duke Power. <clears throat> and in this circumstance, Duke Power had decided that they wanted to use a high school diploma to pre-screen for some jobs um, at, at Duke Power. Um, the problem was that A, historically, people could do this job without a high school diploma. So, yes, it's not unreasonable to say, well, you know, you need a diploma to do this job, but historically, no one has ever needed a high school diploma to do this job. They've been able to do the job successfully without a high school diploma. So if you can do a job successfully without a high school diploma, and you're not changing the nature of the job, then creating the barrier of having a high school diploma can be a problem. So it's an unintended consequence, right? You're removing people who don't have the diploma, which in and of itself is not the problem. It's, it's the circumstance that came up, um, number two, for Griggs versus Duke Power, was that African Americans in this particular geographic area were less likely to have high school diplomas because of Jim Crow and because of historical racism and, and um, you know, the separate put equal um, situation in the school districts, they were less likely to finish school, to, to get the resources they needed to complete school. And so <clears throat> the problem in and of itself, again, wasn't that they were expecting the diploma. Um, it was the combination of the diploma wasn't needed. It was an unnecessary barrier to do the job because people could do the job without the high school diploma and it had an unintended impact against the African Americans who were less likely to have the, to have the diploma. And they were able to do the job, historically, without the diploma. So, of course, that established adverse impact as a form of sex discrimination. And um, Griggs, of course, you know, you know, got his job. And, and, and they got rid of the high school diploma as a criteria for this particular job. Um, and this, you know, again, if someone can do the job and they without the criteria, then the criteria is useless. So we get rid of the criteria. And that's how we sort of check this. And, and so we, to make your prima facie case, you have to have a, a number of cases in order to be able to do a statistical analysis, right? 
And so what we want to look at is historically three, three factors. We want to look at the flow statistics, we want to look at the stock statistics, and we want to look at the concentration statistics. The flow statistics are at the rate at which people flow into the company. You know, from the selection pool, the rate at which we hire them. And so we're going to compare the selection ratio of the, of the two groups, the majority and the minority group, however we define them, and, and to see if they're comparable. And how do we determine if they're comparable? Well, it's about the 80% rule. We, we, we take the ratio of the, the majority group, the one with the higher ratio, and we multiply it by four-fifths or 80%. And then we compare that to your minority group. And we... We compare that to ensure that even if you're making an adjustment like within 80%, you know, we should be hiring at the same ratio within 80%. And we compare and contrast and we look at it and we go, you know, the minority group is not even meeting that minimum threshold of that 80%. And so if they fall below that threshold, even if you adjust it down, and they're still not hitting that threshold, even if you're still hiring women and minorities, you know, or, even, or actually we could even consider white males within this as well, and we could talk about that in class. Um, you know, if that minority group is not even meeting that threshold, that's a problem. You know, you can be still hiring them, but if they're still not meeting that minimum threshold, there's a problem. There appears to be an adverse, unintended impact on this group because they're not being hired at the same rate or a comparable rate. With stock statistics, it's about comparing the ratio of, of individuals or the percentages of people in my company as compared to the local labor market and what should technically be available. And a way to sort of simplistically explain this is looking at qualified women um, you know, in your local area and, and comparing that to the qualified women in your company. And you can look at qualifications through all sorts of surveys and, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics analyses. Another com, you know, way of describing this, right, if you're a, a company in East St. Louis and you hire 75% white people and no African Americans or Latinos, again, you're demonstrating, you know, how do you demonstrate that you are not hiring in an unrepresented way? Well, you need to look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and see what percentage of people living in East St. Louis may have the credentials that you're looking for and that's it is gotten it's very easily gotten so that's our concern so um, we're going to look at whether or not your company sort of represents the local area I mean if you are in you know very white bread northern Wisconsin where it, there's no diversity then your stock statistics aren't relevant here right I mean it's it's if it's all white, then you're not expected to hire more than people who are white in that area. I mean, it's, it's just the way it works. And the same thing, again, if you were the majority group happens to be African Americans and, and white people are complaining they're not being hired at the same rate, again, if, if the percentages of Af if white qualified whites in the area are really low, again, it's not necessarily a problem. Um, so it really kind of depends on what's in my labor market, what's in my geographical or my relevant labor market, and comparing that to what I have in my company and making sure that there's within that 80% that it's relatively reasonable. In terms of the concentration statistics, again, we can have a circumstance where, um, you know, we're hiring an enormous amount of women or we're hiring an enormous amount of African Americans or Latinos, but they're in jobs that aren't advancing. They're in jobs that are very limited in terms of their mobility. They're not going very far. They're never going to get beyond the level they're at. And so imagine you're in a circumstance where your company has 65 or 70 percent women, which you say, woo-woo, 70 percent women, but all of them are in clerical jobs or jobs that aren't going to advance. Um, and that's a problem. They're not going to ever make it to that top management team because of that glass ceiling because we've sort of corralled them into particular jobs that aren't going to go anywhere. They're not going to grow in advance um, and have those same opportunities. So um, with concentration statistics, we have to look at, yes, we could be very diverse in, in gross numbers, right? And, and, but we have to look at where their pockets, you know, are they in pockets of jobs that are mostly clerical or laborers or they're not going to move ahead and all the important high-powered, high-paying advancement type jobs are going to, um, you know, white folks or, or going to white men or going to women, right? It could, you know, certainly could be that way as well. So we want to be really careful of looking at where people are sort of being corralled in their jobs and are they being corralled into jobs that are not going to have the kind of advancement we're looking for. So basically how adverse impact then works is we turn around, we say, you know, 
I think that there's a problem with the hiring rate at this company. We get the data, we do the analysis, we go in and we say, hey, look, there's an adverse impact here. The onus then falls on the employer to say, yes, we may be having an adverse impact, but the selection tool I'm using is good, it's valid, it's legitimate. In which case, if it's a good, valid, legitimate tool, there's not much you can do about it. Um, but if they can, sh if, if it's a situation like Duke Power where they're saying, well, hey, you know, you don't have a high school diploma, but the high school diploma is not needed, it's not valid, it's not legitimate, it's not needed, then that's a problem. That's the adverse impact. How do we, how we, how do we combat this, you know, within the organization? Clearly, one of the things we need to be focusing on is making sure we are not um, using, only using tools with that give adverse impact. And there is a huge battery of, of selection tests that we know certain ones have adverse impact and certain ones don't. So if we're only using tools that have an adverse impact to make all of our hiring decisions, this is a problem for us. One of the things we do to combat this is we use the tool with the adverse impact and we use this in conjunction with tools that don't have an adverse impact because then what we can look at is what is um, what impact does the pocket, um, the package of tools that we're using, um, what impact does that have on people? Any particular tool may have an adverse impact, but if we use it nominally in conjunction with tools that don't have an adverse impact, but we, we know that we're getting some good information on, on really the quality of people's abilities, um, we can use it in conjunction with other tools to minimize that the, the adverse impact that we're having. And that would be at least minimally what would be expected of us um, if we find that some of our tools are creating an adverse impact. If we find that the tools are uh, not legitimate, clearly then we have to get rid of it, like the, the high school diploma example. But if we know, for example, a cognitive ability test tends to have an adverse impact, um, we want to use the cognitive ability test, test in conjunction with other tools that may not have an adverse impact in order to get some of the good information we could get from a cognitive ability test when we make our hiring decision, but use it in conjunction with other tools that are less likely to have that impact so that the, the impact of our overall selection packet or a selection system is minimized. Okay, if that makes sense. He said that there are four basic defenses that employers can use for actually having what we might be perceived as a discriminatory selection practice based on race, sex, religion, et cetera, et cetera. And the first one is this issue of job relatedness. And I've already implied this when I was talking about the high school diploma versus, um, you know, not having the high school diploma or the situation um, where a firefighter, you know, the standards to, to, to hit firefighting is pretty high. And if people don't meet those standards that can't get the job. Now, um, what happens, right? You know, you have the call for adverse impact and then they, in, they validate the selection system and say, here are the tools that we're using and here's, the, here's where we may see some problems. And so this came up with firefighters in some major cities where they, the standards were set really high and they said, hey, you know, you need to meet these standards. And someone said, well, let's validate them. And they realized that they were probably set a little too high. So they adjusted the standards to be more reasonable and not it, not reasonable in such that they said, oh, well, you know, you can only lift five pounds. That's fine. You can be a firefighter. Well, clearly that's not going to work. But they made a legitimate adjustment to, to really what is more practical, more reasonable one would expect. And the selection system still had less women and minorities. It had more beef than before, but it still had less than um, uh, one would expect. And so you do the statistical analysis, you investigate the, the selection system, the selection system is, is legitimate. It's based on legitimate reasons and legitimate expectations to be able to do the job. It is what we call a job-related selection system. And if the selection system is job-related, even if it still has an unintended impact, you can keep that selection system. So it, it if you can't pass the firefighter's test if you're a woman, too bad. You know, the bottom line is you have to meet certain standards, and if your body can't do it, um, uh, you know, then, you know, you have to be able to, um, you, know, you know, address that. So that's the first thing. The job relatedness is about the relationship with adverse impact. Is it having an adverse impact? Well, it, it might be, but... Um, it doesn't mean that it's still illegal discrimination. So um, it has the adverse impact, but it's legitimate because 
the selection system is job related and there's no way of getting around it, then there's nothing we can do if people can't meet that standard. In terms of business necessity, um, um, business necessity means we need to have this particular criteria to have a um, uh, safe functioning, safe and efficient running of our business. Um, and so we do this because it keeps us safe. So, you know, drug tests, total business necessity, right? We need to make sure that we are conducting business in such a way that people um, are not having drug tests. So drug tests might have an adverse impact against some groups. The bottom line is we have to demonstrate that that drug test if we don't do the drug test, this is going to have an adverse impact on our ability to do a particular job. Right? So that's how we get around this. What are some things that don't fall within business necessity? You can't say, my company will only work with white people. You know, my, you know, my customers only like white people, or my customers don't like women, or my customers don't like this. So customer preference is not a, um, a legitimate defense under business necessity. Um, you know, and you might say, well, how do we deal with that when we're dealing with places like Saudi Arabia where women don't work, or Japan where for a long time women executives were not respected in the same way that, that male executives were. It's very different when you're working in a global community than you are within the United States. Obviously, when we're working in a global community, standards are very different, right? So the expectations are going to be very different, and we have to keep that in mind. But within the boundaries of the U.S., we can't turn around and say, well, my clients won't talk to people who are Jewish. My clients won't talk to women. My clients won't talk to African Americans. It's not legitimate. You then get new clients. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just not going to, they're either going to have to learn to deal with it or move on. So business necessity is, is, tool, is, is, is an argument that companies make to say, you know, we need to do this. We need this selection tool because it helps us to be able to do, you know, to, to, to safely operate our business so we can treat people differently because of that. Um, and that's, again, relates to the adverse impact issue. Next thing um, is the bona fide occupational qualification, or what we call a BFOQ. And a bona fide occupational qualification says, it's all right for me to say, I won't hire you because you're a woman to do a particular job. And, and there's rare circumstances where it occurs, but it has been upheld and it does occur. One example is um, within the, um, the, um, uh, the prison system. Um, it's legitimate. It's a legitimate reason to say I'm not going to hire female prison guards to work in a male maximum security prison because again there is a, a differential physical ability between um, men and women. Men have a lot more strength and if you imagine men in a maximum security prison who pretty much have nothing to do but work out and, and beat each other up and you know all the, the, the horror stories that we hear that happens in, in, in prisons you know, women are at a risk for being beat up and being sexually abused by prisoners. And, you know, and, and you can understand that. So, again, the, the, the care has to be taken to recognize, you know, yeah, it would be great to have women in this job, but we really know that there is a, um, there's a differential impact. And in, in, in rare circumstances, the courts will find that it's okay to say, you know, I'm not going to let you do this job because there's just no way we can keep you safe. Now, there are other circumstances where, you, you know, you can say, well, you know, um, and, and a great example of this is Johnson Controls. You know, they're in their um, certain parts of their business deal with very caustic chemicals. And the company initially decided, well, we won't let women you know, work in this job because they are more likely to be affected by this and they may not be able to get pregnant. May not. That's not a guarantee, but they may not be able to get pregnant or have birth defects in the future. So we won't let women do those jobs. Well, they were really high paying jobs. Men were allowed to do them. And, but yet men were also affected by it, but women were not allowed to. And, and the company wasn't thinking about it from the, from the perspective of, well, I want to treat women differently. We want to, um, you know, not let women have these opportunities. It was more from a safety perspective. And in, and in that circumstance, um, just because someone might be able to bear children or might have the capability of bearing them and they might not want them doesn't mean that they should be precluded from doing the job. So this is a, a slightly different circumstance in that there isn't always a possibility that someone will be affected by those chemicals and, um, and not be able to get pregnant or have birth defects. It's a possibility, but it's not a probability. Whereas a woman working in a male's prison 
the probability of getting hurt is fairly high, almost guaranteed, to the point where they could be raped or, or killed, you know, in that circumstance. So it's a slightly different uh, circumstance. The factors involved in that decision are slightly different. And so Johnson Controls had to allow women to do the job as long as they were aware that they were at risk and that they were aware that if they didn't follow safety procedures, they would increase the likelihood of the risk of getting um, exposed to the chemicals and having those problems. And so given that, um, you know, that's a very different circumstance because now women could understand that if I do this, it's, I mean, they won't lose their life, but they might not be able to bear children. Or it's possible that women had their children and they didn't want anymore and it didn't matter to them. So they wanted the opportunity to do those jobs as well. <clears throat> so in those circumstances, the company had to uh, allow women to do that. They couldn't say, um, you can't do this job because you're a woman. Um, where are some other circumstances? Well, I mean, I know as, as, as silly as it sounds, we can't sue the Catholic Church if you're a woman to become a priest, right, or, or the Pope. You, know, you can't say, well, you know, I'm a woman and I'm qualified and I should go do it because religious organizations get to set the rules for, for who should be clergy and who shouldn't be clergy. Um, you know, so they can set those, those expectations. So um, there are rare circumstances where we can say there's a bona fide occupational qualification, typically around gender or religion, um, very rarely, if ever, and I think probably not at all, really around issues of race or color or ethnicity. Um, but certainly around um, uh, sex and religion, there are circumstances where we can argue we really only can hire someone who is this faith tradition or is a woman or is a man to do these particular jobs because it fits. The last one is uh, a bona fide seniority system. In the bona fide seniority system, um, the circumstance is we have to have a legitimate system that says this person has seniority and this person has less seniority. It has to be understood when an employee walks in, they know where they rank in that seniority system, how far they high up or how low they are. And we, clearly there has to be a merit system based on someone's seniority. So the more senior person gets the job opportunity, the less senior person is the first likely first person to be laid off. Now, when does this come into play? We see it most likely when we have um, uh, a situation where an organization may be doing um, affirmative action hiring, where they realize that they are underrepresented in women and minorities, and so they're doing more active diversity hiring in order to get the numbers, the proportions up. But then they have to do a layoff system. And if the company has a bona fide seniority system, the bona fide seniority system trumps the affirmative action. Right? It, it trumps it. So even though I want my company to be more diverse and I've been actively hiring more women and minorities to be more diverse, I have to follow the seniority system. And the seniority system says, last in, first out, the LIFO method, right? It's the last hired, first fired. So if my diverse hires are my most recent hires and they have the least seniority, it doesn't matter if there is an affirmative action intention or com com being compelled to do this. If we have a bona fide seniority system, the seniority system trumps any affirmative action efforts that the company's doing. So, you know, your white, um, if your, your, your majority group, your more senior people are white, they're going to keep their jobs. And there's, n there's, no, there's no argument around this. This is not a form of discrimination. It's because you are basing it on this bona fide seniority system that says the more senior person gets the job, the least senior person is out first. And so it's really important when you go to a company to be clear whether or not there is a bona fide seniority system. If, the, if there is a ranking that people hold and that there are rewards that are related to a seniority system. Where do we typically see seniority systems? In unionized government. Uni unionized jobs, government jobs, public service jobs like firefighters and police officers and things like that. All of these things base all of their promotional opportunities and job opportunities on a seniority system. So that bona fide seniority system trumps, trumps affirmative action every time no matter how hard you want it to be diverse. If the, if, the, if the seniority system is in place, the seniority system works. That's the one that, that, holds, that holds true. 
Title VII has been amended a number of times. I mean, so we're really clear about what is adverse impact, what is disparate treatment, um, but there are all sorts of amendments that have had to occur, because as I said, the law changes all the time, interpretations of the, lay, the laws change all the time, so um, amendments have to occur in order to get some clarity on, on really what these laws mean. So in 1978, Title VII was amended, for example, regarding pregnancy discrimination, because pregnancy became a form of sex discrimination. Pregnant women have a temporary disability, should be treated like any other temporary disability. Someone has a heart attack, someone trips and falls and hurts themselves and can't work, um, they injure their back, what have you. Um, no one goes on you know, medical leave and then comes back and suddenly is told, well, you don't have your job, you can't do your job, or you're fired because of that. You're not supposed to. And so pregnancy needs to be treated like any other short-term disability, and that's part of that. So we didn't want to have women discriminated against because of the fact that they could get pregnant. Second, the Civil Rights Act of 1991 tried to adjust some of the challenges that occurred as case law evolved and really shifted away from the original intent of what the Civil Rights Act was trying to do. Originally, the law said the onus is on the employer to prove that they didn't discriminate, but court interpretations over time shifted so that the burden of proof started to fall back on the employee to prove that they were discriminated against. And, and again, imagine, right? It's like, I don't know what your intentions are. All I can tell you is what I can see you know, as the plaintiff, that these are the facts and this is the circumstances and these this circumstances look like you could have discriminated against me because of that. I don't know what your intention is. I don't know what your decision-making um, reasoning was. You need to prove that your reasoning was not illegal, that you were not illegally deciding to remove me from the pool because of my race, sex, religion, disability, you name it. So the Civil Rights Act of 91 said, okay, the onus has to be on the employer to prove that they did not illegally discriminate. Okay, so originally it had shifted away, but, the, but Congress said, no, our intention is that the burden of proof falls on the employer, period. So all these interpretations of it are incorrect. Our intention is based on um, the employer having to, do the, to, to prove that they didn't discriminate. Other things that the Civil Rights Act of 91 brought about was um, uh, the right to have a jury trial, whereas that was not the case before 1991. And, and again, go back to constitutional law. We have the right to a jury trial. So if you're violating the law in civil rights law, why isn't there a jury trial? So now it said, yes, you can have a jury trial. It's not just a judge hearing your case. It also allowed for compensatory and punitive damages. Again, you know, when a company continually and, and repeatedly discriminates against people illegally, then there's only so many times you can punish them when you really have to hit them hard where their pocketbook is because that's what's going to get their attention. So the compensatory or punitive damages is the way to go on that. Lastly, um, the issue of quotas. Um, it had started to become this issue where we could have a quota. People were thinking of um, em employment law as, well, we have to have a quota of blacks and a quota of whites and a quota of women and a quota of whatever group we wanted. And um, the interpretation is no, there is no quotas. You can't even do race-based uh, norming. You can say, well, I'm compared to other African Americans and you are compared to other whites and, and, and I will hire based on you know, these race-based normings. Race-based norming and quotas are illegal under the Civil Rights Act. The goal is, with affirmative action, is we attract qualified women and minorities and we attract all people into our, into our applicant pool and then we hire based on quality. We hire based on who's the best candidate. That's how it is supposed to legally and appropriately work. People don't always do that, but that is the law and how it's supposed to be interpreted. The last few laws to be aware of in the um, Equal Opportunity Law is, first of all, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which argues we cannot discriminate based on age for those that are 40 or older. I can tell you you're too young to do a job, but I can't tell you you're too old to do the job. You know, we do find that the ADEA is being um, marginalized, largely because companies are making financial arguments. I'm going to get rid of these high-paid workers because these high-paid workers are hurting my budget, and therefore I can't seem to make payroll, and I can't manage this. So given that they can't manage the payroll, um, they are asking the courts to give them permission to lay off these workers. And, but what do we know, right, about the relationship between payroll 
and um, employees, right? Older employees. Older employees make more money as a rule. You know, the more long time that you spend with a company, the more money you make, the more higher paid you are, the more likely you are to uh, be the, in the higher paid echelon of the company. So as you get older and you broach 40 and you, you know, you you know, hit 40 or 50, and then the employer says to you, well, you make too much money, so we're going to fire you, or we're going to let you go. Um, that's, a, that's a problem. I mean, they can make all the legitimate, you know, financial arguments that they want. I mean, ethically and morally, it's bull, and it, the bottom line is, what are you throwing away then? You're throwing away people that have an enormous amount of resources and information and knowledge about the company um, to... Uh, you know, to, to, to make a financial argument. And again, when you, when you think of people only as financial digits on your spreadsheet um, and not people that are invested in, um, you know, the business um, and not something to invest in, you know, that's a concern. So that's how that basically works. Um, so Americans with Disabilities Act uh, passed in 1990, 1991, mm -hmm. and um, the issue with the Americans with Disabilities Act, it was a way of ensuring that uh, disabled Americans who were capable of, perfectly capable of doing jobs, were not being um, left out of the, um, the hiring pool simply because they had a disability. That there, you know, it becomes this assumption that someone's in a wheelchair, therefore they can't do any job whatsoever. They're, they're only limited. Um, well, why would somebody in a wheelchair be limited from doing other jobs unless it required them to walk all over the place? And of course, then they can't do that. Or, you know, someone who's blind who absolutely needs to see what they're doing um, and that there's no accommodation that can be made, you know, in order to, to, to manage that. So that's the challenge there was, you know, how do we accommodate and do a reasonable accommodation and, you know, versus what can be considered to be an undue hardship for a company? And, and, and the relationship between those two things is very context dependent. There's not a hard and fast rule what is a reasonable accommodation versus what is undue hardship because it depends on the company, depends on the extent of the accommodation that's being asked for. Um, it could be that the accommodation might be reasonable if you're in a small business, uh, in a large business, but not so reasonable if you're in a small business, right? So there's all sorts of factors that have to be uh, taken into account when you're trying to make a case for whether or not um, you know, this might be considered a form of illegal discrimination. And your goal under the ADA is to ask people, right, can you do this job with or without a reasonable accommodation? Are you capable of doing this job with or without a reasonable accommodation? And the answer is yes or no. If the answer is yes, then you might not know until later what that accommodation might be, if at all. You know, the goal is, can you do this job with or without the accommodation? If someone can do the job with or without accommodation, then later on they'll tell you, this is the accommodation I need. I need an amplifier on my phone, or I need to allow my seeing eye dog to be here in the office, or I need, you know, to have a wider door so my wheelchair can get through. You know, and how hard is that to be able to do that for people? I mean, again, a smaller business might have more financial difficulties being able to meet some demands. But by and large, most accommodations are only a few hundred dollars. Um, they're not unreasonable and they're not difficult. Um, and here's a great example of a company who lost their argument that they would not make this accommodation for someone. An, an individual was a file clerk, and this file clerk um, had hurt his back. So he could do his job. His job is to file, right? He knows where to find files, how to access files, how to put away files. The one small part of his job that he had difficulty with wasn't wasn't dealing with the day-to-day -day of how to file, but when files were closed and they needed to be archived, he needed to gather the files, put them in a box, and then they got put up on a shelf somewhere, and he couldn't lift the box or put it on a shelf. So the company tried to say, well, you can't do the essential function of your job. Well, in which case, it's wrong. He can do the essential function of his job, because the essential function of his job is to manage the files. One day a month, he needs somebody to lift the box onto a, to a file shelf, that's not an unreasonable accommodation, and it doesn't cost the company anything to ask somebody to help them to lift that box and to put the file, the, the box of files up on a shelf. So he won his case because it was ridiculous that the company would refuse to help him because they thought that that was an unreasonable accommodation. So then we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about Americans with Disabilities Act in the next slide. 
So digging more deeply into the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, it's very clear on what is defined as a disability. It is considered a physical or mental impairment that, lif that limits uh, major life activities. Okay, what's a major life activity? Breathing, sitting, eating, emotional processes, mental processes. So someone who's depressed would be covered. Somebody who's a recovering alcoholic would be considered covered um, because, you know, um, you know, all these things affect. Someone with a learning disability is covered. So all of these things are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act as interfering with a major life activity, all right? So, um, you know, if someone has a breathing apparatus, then they should be able to have, a they can do the job, but they need to have the breathing apparatus. There's no reason why they can't have it there, right? It's a major life function. So we don't want to discriminate based on uh, someone having a disability in and of itself. But if the disability, if the job requires you to be able to see something and you have to see it and make a visual, it's a visual acuity, right? You need to have visual acuity and you are legally blind. You can't do that. There's no accommodation that you can make that can help you do that, right? So that becomes a problem. You can't do the job. If, you know, um, and there's no accommodation that can be made. The, the function of the job requires this particular skill set and you can't do it. Sort of like the adverse impact argument we were talking about before, right? In order to be a firefighter, you have to have these skills. If you don't have these skills, it doesn't matter if, you know, how many women and minorities can't do the job. It's not considered discrimination. It's the same thing here. If, if you can't do what is required of that job and you want to change the thing, you don't get to change the job you either have to be able to do the job the way it's defined um, or you have to you know find another job so there are a couple of things that the EEOC need to, to clarify in, in recent years number one is you know uh, recognizing that a physiological um, disorder may also have an effect on mental or psychological issues and so um, depression and, and um, some organic brain diseases and things like that can be considered covered under there. Someone who had a heart attack, right? Someone who had a heart attack and is recovered, but people still think they are being affected by the heart attack, are also covered. So you don't have to have an actual disability. You have to be perceived to be disabled, to be covered under EEOC and under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And an example of this is someone who has a heart attack and then they go through all their recovery and their heart heals and their heart's fine, no problems. You know, just because they had a heart attack doesn't mean there's a lifelong disability that's attacked. It's attached to it. So the participant has the disability and then they, um, they come back to work and everybody treats them with clean gloves and they don't get the really important uh, job assignments and they don't get promotions because everybody's worried they're going to have another heart attack. And the person has to say, I'm not disabled. My doctor will document. I have no problems with my heart. I can do any job that I want to. I'm fine. You know, I've healed. I shouldn't be limited from this job. That person is covered under the ADA. Even if they don't have a disability, if someone thinks they do and treats them as if they do, then they are also still covered under that. So generally speaking, you know, when we think about, you know, what is a disability, <clears throat> that's the challenge. We have to figure out whether or not it affects a major life function. Then we have to figure out um, to what extent um, the, is an impairment and to what extent does that affect the ability to do that essential function. If you can't do that essential function, okay, at all, even when there is no accommodation, if you, if you need to see something and you can't see it, if you need to be able to walk and carry something, and you really seriously, the essential part of your job is walking and carrying something, you can't do that job. There's not an accommodation in the world that can help you. And just because you have a disability doesn't mean it gives you the right to have a particular job if you really can't fundamentally do the job. All right? So, um, you know, there's no accommodation in the world that can change the fact that you need to see something and you can't see it, you know. So, um, that is still a challenging law to litigate. It's probably one of the most litigated, you know, uh, in the short period of time it's been around. Um, it's one of the most litigated uh, pieces of legislation because there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of uh, contextual factors that go into play um, in what is, uh, you know, an accommodation, what is an undue hardship, what is what is a reasonable way of, of managing something, and what is, what is a disability and what is not a disability. People would even argue some things are not really disabilities. It's just someone's inability to do something. I don't know how to tell you on that one, but um, that, that becomes the con the, content, the continuing argument about it. how do we define disability, how do we then figure out what the adverse
adverse impact is and whether or not it's going to, um, you know, have a, uh, you know, need a reasonable accommodation or something along that line. That's where our problems lie.